Uh, good morning. As Ryan said, my name is Trisha Palmer. I'm a lead meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Greenville, Spartanburg. My co-presenter today is Laura Belanger. She's the senior service hydrologist at the National Weather City. Our presentation is on applying to the National Weather Service entry stats and application resources. Background here, Laura and I developed the first version of this presentation a few years ago, back when I was at Peachtree City and we were both general forecasters. At the time, we co-led the student volunteer program and we put the original presentation together as a local outreach project with nearby universities. We've updated the presentation a few information as it comes out and we presented it several different times as well, uh, including last year for the June 2017 NWA webinar Wednesday. We're really happy to share it again with you guys today and hopefully you all find it informative. Uh, as Ryan also said, Laura and I will be tag teaming the presentation going back and forth, so please bear with us during the transitions. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about diversity in the weather service today. So the picture here on our title slide is from March 30th of 2017, when Atlanta had an all-female crew on board and just for have the MIC there, Keith Stellman. And then here's me in operations at GSP. Today we're going to cover several topics. We're going to start out with some basic background information on the National Weather Service, which some of you may already know, but it's a good overview for those who don't. Uh, then we're going to go over some information about employment in the federal government, the Weather Service spe specifically. Then we're going to move into the nuts and bolts of the application process, and we'll finish with some enlightening statistics gathered from a few mass intern bids over the past few years. Um, as a disclaimer, Laura and I are part of the operational staff at our respective offices. And while we've bid on jobs ourselves and we've reviewed probably hundreds of resumes and have been involved in the selection process at our current offices, uh, we are not officials. Um, also, we're given based on current procedures and data. Things can and occasionally do change, as you'll see with some adjustments I'll, I'll mention here uh, in the presentation. So if you're watching this as a recording later, please keep that in mind. Okay, so I have here the National Weather Service mission statement, and I'm not going to read it to you verbatim, but the important thing is that we provide science-based decision support services for the protection of life and property. Now, as you will hopefully know, we are government. Our parent agency is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. We have several sister agencies within NOAA, um, Office of Atmospheric Research, and NESDIS being probably the most familiar for you guys. As for the local field offices within the Weather Service, we have three main types. We have weather forecast offices, river forecast centers, and center weather service units, which are more aviation meteorologists. The U.S., besides the INSEP centers, which are listed here on the right, the Weather Service is broken up into six regions, which include almost 180 separate field offices. And we're going to, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to be focusing on the weather forecast offices in this presentation. Just for a geographical representation, this should give you a good idea of where all of these offices are located. You can see the six regions by the color shading of the states in the background. Um, Atlanta is in seven regions, so the purple states, and my office, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, is in eastern regions, so the green states. Uh, the sort of squiggly lines uh, all through there, those are the RFC boundaries, which rather than geopolitical are geographical based on the river basins, so that just sort of gives you an idea of where their areas are. Um, now, just again, some more notes and disclaimers. As I mentioned before, we're going to be focusing on weather forecast offices in this presentation, but we want you all to realize that there are really a variety of career options and paths in the weather service, including information technology, hydrology, hydrometeorology, aviation, and even others. A as a case in point, Laura was recently promoted at Peachtree City from a general forecaster to the senior service hydrologist. So please feel free to let us know if you'd like any more information, either during the presentation if you have questions or um, uh, afterwards or always offline at any time. Okay, now the typical career ladder at a weather service forecast office looks something like this. Uh, you're going to start as an intern where you're doing lots of training and learning the ropes. Now, just to put this out there, there is a proposal to change the intern position and actually absorb it into the general forecaster position, and this may go into effect in the next couple of years. Until then, though, after the intern, you move to general forecaster, and after that, you can move up to a senior forecaster. Now, the difference on a senior forecaster isn't necessarily about it. Certainly, you have to be a general forecaster first, but the, the more it's about supervision. The senior forecaster is the shift supervisor on every shift. 
And then after that, if you choose, you can move up to management. The um, warning coordination meteorologist is the liaison with external customers, the emergency management community media, uh, while the SU, the science and operations officer, is in charge of science and research and training in the office. And then finally, there's, there's the meteorologist in charge, who in addition to being a meteorologist, is also in charge of property, contracts, uh, all the stuff that you went to four to six years of college to learn to do, right? Yeah, no, no, not quite. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Laura to talk about some statistics and background about federal employment. So bear with me for just a second. And Laura, you should have it. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, so um, as Trisha mentioned, my name is Laura Belanger. I am here at the um, Weather Forecast Office in Atlanta. And this section, we're gonna focus a little bit on the meteorologist job statistics that are out there. Okay, so if you go and look at um, the Bureau of Statistics and um, look to see how they break down the field of meteorology and the jobs associated in that field, um, the latest statistics that they have are from 2016, and they, there's about 10,400 meteorologist jobs in the in the United States. Um, now that does vary between government, private, academia, broadcast meteorologists, um, and then some other things like, for example, the military that aren't included into that government category. Now you can see that. Only about a quarter of the jobs out there are associated with uh, government agencies, and about 40% of those are in the private group. And we could argue now that um, students that are exiting college now with their degrees have more opportunities in the private sector than people who have been working in the field for many, many years. So that's a good thing to hear. Um, and the other good thing is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they, they expect that there's going to be a 12% job growth over the next um, 10 years from when these statistics were created. So by 2026, they're expecting nearly 12,000 uh, meteorology jobs. So that's always good news to hear um, for people who especially are just now entering into um, the their academic careers for meteorology. Now, one of the big always hear uh, from people who are looking into the weather, how kind of the makeup and diversity is, um, is the gender makeup of the National Weather Service. And so we just kind of took two uh, screen captures here of, of um, the 2009 makeup of the, the Weather Service and then the 2017 makeup of the Weather Service. And you can see that the number of women uh, entering the workforce has actually increased. So, um, and these are Weather Service permanent employees. These aren't just, you know, general NOAA temp employees. These are permanent employees. So that's a good thing. Now, if you were to break that down by the meteorology positions, so um, Trisha spoke about uh, those entry level meteorologists, the interns, those are still permanent positions coming in, and then um, moving to general forecaster, so on and so forth until you get to management. You can see that there is a little bit of um, a skew towards a more male dominant uh, uh, percentage in the lead forecasters and management. Um, there is some issues with keeping uh, or retaining those women as, as they move up in their careers. And so that's a big focus in trying to get women to stay in the career field um, and making some adjustments uh, to the work environment. Now you can see that it's about a little less than a quarter of the workforce there and in interns and general forecasters um, are female. Um, and and then if you move further into the ethnicity of the Weather Service, again, we're comparing 2009 and 2017. These are self-reported statistics. So it's however the person identifies themselves, but you can see that we've actually become more diversified in the Weather Service. And so that's a, a good thing as well. Now, when you look back at, um, at the, of the education background, the academic, uh, background and experience of those who are in the Weather Service. Again, these are self-reported statistics, um, and these are of current employees. So um, bear in mind that this does include uh, like administrative assistants or um, uh, those in the technology side of things like our um, uh, service analysts and all those systems analysts. Uh, that 
their statistics are also included in this pie chart. But you can see that um, bachelor's degrees make up about 60% of the weather service. Uh, we're now starting to see more and more people entering the weather service workforce uh, with higher level uh, degrees. For example, we've got more than a quarter with a master's degree and so, so on and so forth. So um, that's a big thing and, and we'll highlight that a little bit more in one of the later sections on how you can make yourself stand out when you only have a bachelor's degree. Now, as far as the salary potential goes, again, we're breaking this down by those Bureau of Labor Statistics type categories. And you can see that um, the government, the Weather Service is really starting out um, forecasters with that box and whiskers. If we're looking at the bottom of the box, we're starting uh, forecasters out a little bit higher than the rest of these uh, average um, positions in these other sec sectors. Um, now, I will say that the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that the average salary or the median salary for meteorologists is about $92,000 a year. Um, but keep in mind that that does include uh, people like broadcast meteorologists. And when you're in a big market, you do have the potential to be paid a little bit more. Um, that's why you see that whisker in that category go up all the way up to a quarter million dollars. So um, what, one other thing to notice here is that most of these categories are topping out around $100,000. Um, now, if you are you if you have more of a, a specified niche, for example, like let's say you're in programming or something, especially if you get in the private sector, you may have the potential to, um, to increase your salary a little bit more. And so you're seeing that reflected a little bit in the, the whisker on the upper end of things. Now, if we were to look at um, several different companies, um, this, this came from a, a self-reporting site, um, glassdoor.com. It had to have at least four people with general forecaster um, title. Uh, we included them in this graph to give you some kind of idea of how people are getting paid. So you can see that the Weather Service really on average has the highest uh, average salary there um, on that far left of the graph. And you can see that there are others that have uh, that start their forecasters off at a much lower level. So just to give you some perspective here on where the, the Weather Service, uh, you know, an arguer pro for, for joining the Weather Service workforce, um, this is a good graph to show that. Now, within the Weather Service, once you enter as an entry-level meteorologist or an intern, um, you're starting on that lower end, but you very quickly can get promoted to a GS-12 level. It usually takes anywhere between one and four years, um, and there's a rigorous um, training requirements that are included in, in this one to four year period. And some people can get those done a little bit earlier, depending on when you enter the workforce, what time of year that is, and when those training courses are offered. But traditionally, um, within that short span of time, you jump up to a GS-12, um, and you could retire at this level, actually. Um, but most people use that as a stepping stone, stone to get further into the workforce. So um, a GS-13, those are our lead forecasters. As Trisha mentioned, those are the, the ones making supervisory uh, type decisions in the operations area. And you can see that at that point, you're going over $100,000. And then if you move into the management side of things, you're over $100,000 and inching up towards 125, 130, depending on how long you're in in the weather service. Now, this does vary based on uh, where you're located. We do have locality pay. So um, somebody who lives in California, for example, gets paid a slightly higher amount than some other rural portions of the country. Now, as far as um, other benefits for federal employees, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about pros and cons, that sort of thing. Um, as I mentioned, there's locations across the country uh, with 122 offices, you could basically go wherever your little hearts desire. Um, and that's a great thing. Um, the, the con to that is that at times our um, hiring is a lot lower than others. Uh, and so, you know, in general, we're looking at 25 to 50 um, jobs or people that are hired each year to fill vacancies. Um, on the pro side, you have a known salary potential. You know what that window, that range is. And again, we're, we tend to be on the higher side of average compared to other private companies. Um, but at the same time, 
if you're looking for a really high salary, um, the government work may not offer that. Salaries greater than $150,000 are pretty rare. Um, you may be in better luck going into the programming or IT side at a private uh, company doing weather or model training or something like that. Now, we do have compensation for working sort of odd hours. Uh, we do get extra pay for nights, Sundays, holidays, and overtime. Um, but rotating shift work is often required. Um, even in my role as the senior service hydrologist, um, there's a certain component of rotating shifts that is still necessary um, and still required. And so um, some people really enjoy having, you know, weekdays or days off um, and working nights, but some people may not. Other pros and cons, for example, um, we have great job security. Uh, nearly every year we get an annual pay raise that tries to help us keep up with inflation. Um, but on the con side, you know, the job security and nearly annual pay raises, um, you know, it, it may be not quite what you're looking for. Um, somebody who has the same position title you do uh, is going to get paid the same amount regardless of the amount of time and effort that they put in their position um, compared to you. At the same time, though, uh, you do have the opportunity for some cash awards, which are like small bonuses, um, for uh, helping yourself stand out, contributing uh, above and beyond to the operations of your office. Um, positions other than the intern position, um, the government offers paid moving expenses. So if you uh, have received a job across the country, your move will get paid by the government. Um, and so that's a big pro as well. Uh, and then we have excellent benefits, time off, retirement. Um, those are things that I'm going to cover here in just a minute. Now, unfortunately, as far as the cons go, um, you know, a lot of people have this idea that uh, we're the government, we're here to help stigma. And, and so that can be a negative. And so that may be some, a big thing that you have to overcome in dealing with your partners. Um, change can be slow. And at times there's a lot of red tape that you have to move through or push through to, to allow things to go into effect or um, to improve things. Now, as far as your benefits go, uh, the government does offer a generous leave program. Um, we have holidays, we have uh, vacation and sick leave. Uh, we call the vacation annual leave. Um, now your sick leave accrues all the time. Um, and so that there is no maximum there. Uh, and as far as vacation time goes, uh, you are allowed to accrue and roll over 30 days of leave, uh, and then uh, that rolls over to the next year. You continue to accumulate more. Uh, in general, it ranges between 12 and 26 days off, um, which is pretty significant. Um, now, if you compare that to another company, uh, I've put two companies on there, um, and you can see that the number of holidays, the amount of vacation time and sick leave isn't always comparable. And so um, that's important to remember as well. Um, the government does offer health, life, disability, and long-term care insurance if you choose to participate in those programs. And then we have the thrift savings plan, um, which is a, a good way to save for retirement. There is a government match, dollar for dollar up to 3% of your base pay. And then up to 5%, um, they do continue to contribute. And so um, that's big. A lot of companies don't do that. And so uh, that does help put away money for retirement as well. Now, I'm going to pass it back to Tricia. And she is going to speak to you guys about applying for a national weather position and sort of the ins and outs of that. OK, well, thanks, Laura. Alrighty, um, first some background on the general schedule. Laura mentioned the GS levels associated with intern, forecaster, etc. Um, this is the pay system that covers the majority of civilian white collar federal employees. Um, the Office of Personnel Management administers it. Within the general schedule, there are 15 grades, and Laura mentioned that like MICs are GS 15s. Um, and within each grade, there are actually 10 steps. Each step is approximately a 3% increase in salary. So within one grade, though, it normally takes 18 years to, to advance from step one to step 10. Now, for an intern, that's not really much of an issue because you usually move up pretty quickly. 
Um, so now that we at least recognize what GS means, uh, we can talk about the entry level requirements for the various GS levels that are covered in the intern position. What I have listed here is the minimum requirements for each entry level position, GS 5, 7, and 9. Now, as a note, interns skip the even number GS levels going from five to seven after a year, if all the training requirements are met, like Laura mentioned, and then nine after another year, and then you max out at GS 11, whereas a general forecaster is a GS 12. And that's once you get to a 12, that's when those steps, 12 step one, step two, that's when they really start taking effect. So here you can see approximately how much the salary increases for each GS level within the intern position, which is actually a pretty substantial difference. Now, just as a note, though, you may be qualified for a GS9, say if you have your master's degree, but you may only be offered a position at a GS5 or at best seven. So you've got to keep that in mind and be ready to accept that if, if you're willing to take it. Now, in order to become a meteorologist with the Weather Service, you must have your degree in atmospheric sciences or related field that includes everything listed on this slide. Again, I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you because this is all clearly listed at USA Jobs, and I'll talk about USA Jobs in just a second. But it's important that you all realize you must meet these requirements before you bid. So how does the application process work? Well, first you have to have your resume ready and hopefully most of most if not all of you do. Uh, once a position is posted, you can then apply. Each position is usually open for about two weeks before it closes. And once the bid closes, the applications are reviewed by our workforce management office. Now, as a note, these are human resources personnel. These are not meteorologists. Uh, first, they go through to determine if the candidates meet the minimum requirements. So anyone who isn't deemed uh, eligible uh, is not kicked, is kicked out. You're deemed not eligible, you're kicked out, and that'll show up on your USA job status. After that, they go through the applications a second time to rank the candidates based on a variety of criteria with uh, questions that are answered within the application. It's only after these two passes that approximately the top 10% of candidates are sent to the selecting official, which is typically the MIC, and we call this top 10%, we call that the panel. And then the MIC and or his or her team reviews the applications, and then they narrow down the top several for interviews if they choose to do them. And then after the interviews, the MIC then gives the name of the selectee to workforce management, who then in, in turn contacts the selectee with the offer, who then in turn accepts or rejects the officer. And then the real fun begins with lots of paperwork. Now this whole process can take as little as 12 weeks to as much as a year, depending partly on how busy workforce management is uh, and how long it takes to process all the paperwork and uh, a few other random factors. Um, so just again, keep that in mind. It, you might not get something right away. It might take some time. Okay, so how do you apply? Well, first you need to go to usajobs.gov. Uh, you've got to create an account, and they have a new process this, just this year that you create a login.gov account, which will include USA Jobs. Once you have an account, you create your profile with your background and demographic information, like your address, your phone number, and things like that. Um, and after that's done, you can add documents, um, such as your resume, your transcripts, and anything else that you need, and we'll talk more on this later. Once you've created your profile and your resume um, and all that, you're gonna wanna start searching for jobs. The easiest way to do this is by position and each position has a specific series number assigned to it. Meteorologist, for example, is 1340. However, not only NOAA employs meteorologists, so if you're looking for weather service jobs, you can narrow these down by department and agency. Um, so here's an example of a search for 1340 meteorologist jobs. And on the lower right here, you can see where it says uh, department and agency. Um, so you can click on that to narrow down just to NOAA positions. Also, you'll see the little colored dots by each position. If you're not in the federal government, you need to look for the light blue dots, meaning that the position is open to the public because you won't be eligible for anything in the dark blue or the green or whatever because you're not already a federal employee. Um, now, as I mentioned before, the positions are generally open for two weeks at a time. You're gonna wanna preview the vacancy questions by clicking on the little plus sign by how to apply and you scroll to the very bottom of that pop-up window and you'll see where it says, click here to preview the questions. Now, this is really important because it's these questions that will rank you when workforce management does that second pass. Uh, there are several questions that you're gonna need to answer and you'll need to support your answers with information in your resume. 
definitely maximize your answers and give yourself the benefit of the doubt, but please, please do not lie. Um, so here's just an example of one of the questions and the different answers that are available for you to choose. Sometimes the way the answer is worded won't necessarily apply specifically to you, but do your best and find the answer that makes the most sense if you can. Uh, now, a tip for the application process is to take certain key words or phrases and embed them in your resume. So for example, in this question here, do you have experience, yada, 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 um, maybe zero in on the real time and archive databases or data integrity and weave those into the wording of your resume somewhere. Okay, so for something new, um, for the past few years, th these bids for interns um, have been open as mass bids with positions for 10 or maybe 20 or more offices announced in the same bid. Uh, you'll see the one that I just had on the previous slide had like 30 something offices. It was a huge number. Uh, and in the past, you could apply for every one of those locations listed. And then the MICs would get a ridiculous number of names to weed through with some approaching uh, 200 applicants on their panel. So as you might imagine, if that's the top 10%, you know, we're having between 1,000, 2,000 um, people applying for these jobs. But this year, they're no longer allowing that. You can only choose up to five locations. Uh, now, supposedly, this makes it easier for the MIC because there are fewer candidates. Um, I heard from an MIC at a very popular office who said it really didn't make much of a difference there. But then I heard from a Sioux at a more remote office that said they only got 10 applicants when this went into effect, whereas in years previous, they had been getting uh, 75, 100 names. So the bottom line is you need to choose your five locations wisely. Uh, your chances of being selected at the popular office I just mentioned are probably pretty low, but a one in 10 chance at a more remote office is pretty darn good. Uh, so maybe split your locations up, maybe a couple you really want and then a couple that might maybe might have fewer applicants. Uh, this is kind of a tough one because this, since this hasn't been effect very long, it's, it's kind of hard to know what the best strategy is. Okay, so on to your resume. Um, in USA Jobs, you can upload a resume that you've developed or you can use the internal resume builder. Really, either is fine, but just as a note, a more professional looking PDF that you design and upload will probably be easier on the eyes for the MIC. Um, but we do suggest that you at least click through the resume builder so that you can see what, uh, what kind of information it says that you should include. Um, so for that resume builder, you start by giving it a name. And once that's done, um, you can start adding work experience. Now, within each work experience, you provide the pertinent data, such as location, your position title, salary, how long you worked there, um, as well as your duties and accomplishments and skills. And as you can see on, on this slide, it's just one box where you can add your duties, accomplishments, and skills. And you can't really add uh, bullets. You can't format it very well. So that's why sometimes the PDF is better. Um, once the work experience is complete, you can add your education. And then other information such as training, languages, organization, affiliation, publications, awards, leadership experience, just about anything you can think of. So this is the kind of stuff that it suggests you put in your resume. So as you're developing one, uh, if you're doing one on a PDF separately, these are the kinds of information that you can add. So some things to include in your resume. Since this is an intern position, go ahead and include all of your jobs. They provide an insight to your character. Now, for example, maybe you wanted your meteorology degree and you were not above working as a janitor or a pooper scooper or whatever to earn the money needed to pay for your classwork. Um, as well, add the, timeline, as, add the timeline of your work experience during and after school. Now, if there are gaps in your timeline, you might wanna be ready to explain them um, for example, you had a child and decided that you wanted to be a stay-at-home parent for a while. Um, and then once you're in, you can get rid of all the non-meteorology stuff. But for now, go ahead and include them all. Within the resume builder itself is a question for each work experience. Is it okay to contact your current supervisor? Um, just as a note, it looks really bad and raises a lot of eyebrows if you say no. Uh, when it comes to your references, please ask permission before listing individuals. Uh, you can include personal references like a neighbor or a community leader or a pastor or something, but we do suggest limiting this to only one. So other things to include, any meteorology related experience that you have, it doesn't matter what it is or where it came from, um, go ahead and include it. Definitely include leadership and team activities, even if it's not meteorology, such as a student body leadership or fraternity or sorority leadership, things like that. Any awards and accomplishments you have, including scholarships or like if you saved the mayor's cat and got a key to the city, uh, go ahead and include it. 
professional societies. Uh, Laura will touch on this later, and this is, of course, an AMS webinar, but the AMS and NWA are excellent ways to expand your network and the breadth of your experiences. So if you're not a member, join now. Um, and naturally, any community service or volunteer work. Um, so some more resume tips here. Um, please don't use paragraphs. Bullets are much easier on the eyes. Imagine an MIC trying to read paragraphs in 150 plus resumes. Um, that's, uh, that's really tough. Organize your details by subject and reverse chronologically. Um, and I talked about this earlier, but go through the questions in the application and find a way to include an experience or justification for every question in there. And please spell check. That should be a no-brainer, but apparently it's not. Um, very, very important. Try to find a current Weather Service employee somewhere to review your resume and application because they may have some insights and tips and tricks um, that would be more specific to you. If you don't know someone in the Weather Service, use your network. Find somebody who does know someone. Uh, and, and also important, know that for the weather service, shorter isn't necessarily better. You really don't want to go overboard, of course, but a one or two page resume just will not cut it. There's not enough information about you and the things that you've done. However, you could consider uploading a full resume and then maybe a corporate or summary resume for easy reference so that they can go back and look, oh, this person did this and just look real quick. Um, now, now is the time to add to your resume. Um, get experience, get lots of it. There are several programs out there. The most lucrative of these is the Pathways Program, which is a federal student internship. The Holling Scholarship is fantastic. Uh, find a way to volunteer at a WFO. Uh, if nothing else, be a teaching assistant or at least find some sort of research project to get involved in. Leadership is huge. Demonstrate that you can lead. It, it can be kind of tough, especially in college, because you're all competing for a limited number of jobs or financial resources. But one of the best and most rewarding things you can do is to help others accomplish their goals. And as a side note, this is a really small field. You never know who might be your boss someday. So do not burn bridges. Be helpful, be a leader, and check your ego at the door, please. Okay, so on to some of that additional information you need. Um, first of all, your transcripts. You need one for every degree completed, not high school, of course. Um, even if your degree is incomplete, include what you have so far. Uh, your cover letter. Now, this is optional, and you're only allowed one per application. So if you're using USA Jobs, you need to be generic. One strategy applicants is using is to snail mail a cover letter to each individual MIC if they're applying for that office. Some MICs like them, some can take them or leave them, but what they can do is they can provide some insight into you as a person. And I guarantee you, every MIC is asking, why does this person want to work at my office? Do they have something to really offer to the team or do they just want a job? And, and then there's the other stuff, which can include educational requirements, letters of references, um, things like that. Um, please note that only one other document is allowed um, so if you have multiple documents you'd like here, you might need to combine them into one PDF. Um, I'll talk more about the educational requirements in just a minute. If you're bidding on a job through a non-competitive process, such as veteran preference, you need to make sure you upload the proper documents for that. Um, and as a note for everyone, non-competitive applicants are automatically put on the top of the panel, which may cut some of the bottom folks out. Uh, but in my opinion, for veterans especially, they've served our country, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so for those educational requirements, sometimes your transcript isn't clear. Maybe, for example, you took a physics lab, but it's not listed separately. Maybe it's uh, you, it's listed as physics with a uh, like a four-hour course, a, a two-hour, uh, maybe a three-hour course itself and a one-hour lab, um, but it doesn't list it separately. Well, you have to have your physics lab uh, listed. Or maybe it just says meteorology three instead of thermodynamics. So if if in doubt, add a document detailing how you meet the criteria. Or maybe you actually don't meet the requirements in the, with the courses in your actual degree. Maybe you never took remote sensing. Maybe your degree doesn't say that you have to take differential equations. It's important to remember that just because you have a degree doesn't necessarily mean you meet the requirements. Now, most degrees do, but it's incumbent on you to make sure you meet the requirements. So what we suggest is to add a document explaining how you meet the requirements. Spell it out for workforce management so that they, they can't miss it at all. Uh, here's an example using the courses at Georgia Tech. Again, spelling it out. This is how I, how I meet the two hours of remote sensing of the atmosphere and or instrumentation. 
and then how many hours are completed. This, again, this is just an example. You can do this any, time, any way you want, but we do suggest that you go ahead and do that. Uh, note that you also need to specify in your resume that you're a U.S. citizen and, if necessary, that you're registered for the selective service. Um, now, we talked a little bit about the panel earlier. Again, the panel is approximately the top 10% of applicants. Um, on USA Jobs, after you bid, your status will eventually change to eligible or not eligible, and then finally either to referred or not referred. If you're referred, you know, congratulations, that's, that's, that's great. Um, this is what it looked like a few years ago for me. You might get an email that your status has changed to, but not always. Um, after you've made the panel, then it's time for the interview if the MIC chooses to do this one. Um, different MICs do it differently, but generally between five and 10 candidates are interviewed. Adam Roser, who's presenting at 2.30 Eastern time, he'll have more information on this. But just to give you a quick idea of some possibilities, um, you might have a basic phone interview or a more presentation intense video teleconference. It might be just with the MIC or it might be with an entire selection team. You might do one interview or you might do a series of them as they narrow down candidates. You might just have an oral interview or there could be written questions or even a presentation as part of the requirements. Again, every MIC is different. Okay, so what happens if you're selected? Well, if so, you'll get an email from workforce management with a tentative offer. It'll look something like this. And um, note that you'll have a limited amount of time from the receipt of that email to respond, accepting or rejecting the tentative offer. Please follow the instructions carefully. And in this case, you had two work days. <clears throat> Please do follow those instructions. Um, we highly recommend that you do not bid on a job you're not willing to take. Um, sometimes maybe you're accepted at another office and then you get an offer from a different office. So in that case, it's okay to reject it, but please don't just willingly change your mind. It's a lot of work for an MIC and the selecting team and workforce management to go through all of this. After you accept, you'll receive another email from workforce management with the formal offer letter, and this may take some time. And then of course there's paperwork, lots and lots of paperwork, security paperwork and all sorts of fun stuff. And one last quick digression, because there are some positions out there or coming that I want to highlight. There is a mass intern bid expected soon, and seriously, it could be tomorrow. Um, as a note, it does include four, yes, four intern vacancies at the Atlanta office, so just sort of putting that plug out there. Um, also, highlighting the Pathways internships. These are paid internships for current students, and they do include benefits, and one just opened up yesterday. Um, you'll note that it's a GS7, so they're targeting grad students, and there are two positions, both of these at the Meteorological Development Lab in Silver Spring, Maryland. Okay, I know that was a lot of information, and I'm sure you'll all figure out the process as you go through it, but I'm happy to answer any questions if we have time at the end or offline. And for now, though, I'm gonna pass it back to Laura to talk about the bad news. Okay, thanks, Tricia. Um, so, unfortunately, we needed to include some of the harsh realities here. Um, a lot of these statistics were um, published from John Knox back in 2008, um, and they still hold true today. And the portion of this talk actually came from um, a, an invited presentation where we went to a local university, and Tricia and I spent some time briefing them on ways that they could make themselves look a little bit more competitive in entering the workforce. And so um, it was kind of striking to look at these statistics and really see what the chances are of being able to enter federal employment with a bachelor's degree. So we wanted to share that with you. So the estimated number of um, bachelor's degrees earned each year in meteorology or atmospheric science or some kind of related physical science degree is greater than 600. Uh, now the estimated number of entry level bachelor's meteorology positions every year is only less than 300. So you can see that there's a big discrepancy there. So the estimated number of entry level National Weather Service positions that are open per year. We um, have already brought this up a couple of times. It's ranging between 25 and 50. So the harsh reality in this is that your chance of obtaining entry-level meteorologist position anywhere immediately following graduation. If you're only looking at the numbers, it's about 50%. But in reality, it's less than 25%. And the reason is because you're competing with people with um, 
higher level degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, people who are um, exiting the private sector and wanting to enter um, the National Weather Service and those who have completed military service. So the take home point here is that more than 75% of you will either have to make a choice of leaving the field to pursue other options of employment or go to graduate school to try and make yourself look a little bit more competitive. So your chance of obtaining entry level National Weather Service position immediately following your graduation with a bachelor's degree, again, by the numbers, because of the number of positions open each year, it's only about 5%. But in reality, it's basically zero. Um, and again, that's you're competing with other people that have um, higher academic uh, qualifications military uh, personnel and private sector experience. So in order to be offered a position at the National Weather Service, you're gonna have to set yourself apart. And you can do that by pursuing a graduate degree, um, doing a short stint military service or uh, going to the private sector and, and taking advantage of what that sector has to offer. Um, so what Trisha and I did was we looked at two mass bid um, panels and then they were from 2014 and from 2016. And the combined total of um, positions that were filled from this was 73. So um, roughly in that time frame, I believe we were seeing 1,600 unique uh, applicants for those two mass bids. Uh, and so when you take the applicants and you uh, weed out the top 10% to create the panel, we're talking anywhere between 140 and 160 applications that these hiring officials were having to go through. Now, because we mentioned it before um, with the gender distribution, one of the interesting things here is that um, the gender distribution of the panel is about 86%. So it's actually um, uh, tens more male than the gender makeup of the National Weather Service. Um, and those selected, it was roughly about the same, closer to about 80%. Um, male and 20% female. Now, if we look at just the uh, education background of these applicants, um, you can see that the blue outlined uh, pie chart is that's the diversity of the panel. So those are people who got weeded out um, top 10% of the applicants. They may or may not have gotten an interview. And you can see that less than half of them just had bachelor's degrees. Uh, about half of them had a master's degree and about 10% had some additional graduate work. They may not have had a master's degree completed or they had a PhD. So you can see those kind of um, broken out there. Now, as far as those that were actually selected, over half of them had a master's degree. And if you add in the PhD and the additional graduate work that helps them out, that's an additional uh, 14% there. So 30% of, of these selectees had bachelor's degrees, and that was it. Um, so if you further then broke that down, um, you could say, well, I'm top of my class. I'm the best forecaster in weather challenge. Um, I, am, I am the best student coming out of my university. Couldn't I be the one that's competitive with just a bachelor's degree? So we then further broke it down. We pulled out only those 30% of, of people who made the panel who had a bachelor's degree. And we further looked at whether they had additional experience. So for example, um, whether or not they spent time in the private sector, did they volunteer at a National Weather so Service office? Did they have a combination of those two things? Any military experience? Uh, any previous government paid work, like a hauling scholar. Um, we don't have the SCEP program anymore, but SCEP or Pathways, those were all other options. Maybe you worked in a government agency that wasn't the National Weather Service, but it was still government employment, or if you had research publications. And so the big thing here to note is the big black box area, that 11% 11% of the, the people who applied with only a bachelor's degree didn't have anything additional to back up that, um, that academic career. And if you then look at those who were selected, that 0% that's above my pie chart, 0% of the people who had nothing but a bachelor's degree were selected for these 73 positions. 
Um, and so you can see that there was a, a decent breakout of, of those people who had been in the private sector and volunteering. But, um, and so the big take home message here is, um, you know, government work or program experience that, that holds a lot of weight, that carries a lot of weight in your resume. Um, even just coming in to a weather service office, introducing yourself, maybe doing um, some shadow shifts. You may not be able to com uh, completely commit to a volunteer position that comes in maybe a couple times a week or a couple times a month, but even coming in and shadowing a forecaster, that gets your name in the office and passed around a little bit. And these people can start to see that you really are passionate about your, your career. Um, 20% had private sector experience, the other 10% had military experience. Um, and, and so the, those, again, help you stand out. Now, if you looked at the experience of the entire panel, so not just those that had bachelor's degrees, but also those who had um, some graduate level work or master's work, um, you can see, again, it's about 11% of the entire panel. And 3% of that actually made it into the selection. So these could be people who had master's degrees or had taken some graduate level coursework, but that was it. They just had their academic career to show for them. Um, and it's possible that they may have been selected, um, as Tricia mentioned earlier, at maybe a more rural office that had less competition. And so if you don't have the ability to pursue um, higher level education, um, a higher level degree, or uh, getting some additional employment opportunities, then possibly try and leverage your um, your opportunity there to bid on a position that might have less uh, competition. So now what are your options? Uh, and so moving forward, again, you can pursue a graduate level degree, but you know, money may be an issue or time may be an issue. Um, you may be uh, unable to um, pursue any kind of higher level education at a university that you'd like to. Um, so that may not be an option for you. You may have the opportunity to join the military. Um, you can go in, get some experience for a couple years, and then they have veterans preference when you come out. Uh, you have the opportunity to seek other employment. Uh, even if you have to leave the field of meteorology to work for uh, an unrelated private sector company, um, that's something to put on your resume, but always be sure that you're going to your local AMS chapter meetings or you're um, visiting the Weather Service office every once in a while. Um, it can help, again, with your networking and your visibility. And to that, make sure you're establishing and maintaining your network. So people, professors, um, visiting uh, presenters that have come to your university or your um, organizations and presented, make sure that you're kind of keeping up with them. Stay in touch with those people. Uh, you need to step up your game. Again, I mentioned go to your local chapter meetings, AMS, NWA, um, and get involved. Volunteer. You may not be able to volunteer at a weather service office. It may be too far for you to drive, but there's probably some other local uh, meteorology related field that would allow somebody to come in and shadow. Consider doing research, um, presenting at conferences or publishing um, at in newsletters, not necessarily peer reviewed, but doing some kind of publication to show that you're researching and you're putting your name out there. Those are all things that can help you stand out. Be a model student. Again, Tricia mentioned this before. Check your ego at the door. Um, th these are all opportunities for you to kind of uh, show yourself and um, display yourself as having good character and a uh, team player, something that a, a National Weather Service office is looking for. Be a leader. It does not matter what your position title is or um, you know how well you're doing in your classes. You can still be a leader um, in how you're relating to other people. And so that's always important. Um, I found in this field that there's basically nobody uh, that is employed by the weather service or even in a private company, a meteorology position that isn't passionate about their job. No one stumbles into meteorology just by accident. And so um, we are all passionate about this field and make sure you're incorporating that passion into what you're doing. 
make sure you have a backup plan. Um, for those of you who are still in um, a university program, consider a double major or a minoring in, um, with a bachelor's degree. Um, any kind of foreign language, programming skills, um, if you have the opportunity to um, pursue something related like civil engineering, um, something along those lines, those can always be helpful. Um, you could always pursue a related field for your, your master's degree. It may not be meteorology, it could be a master's in emergency management. That would be considered really desirable right now. Other things that you could pursue, like I mentioned, um, business degrees, engineering, um, administration or communications, social science, social science and psychology and understanding how people um, respond to warnings that are issued by the Weather Service. That is a big topic of discussion right now. And so all these things can be utilized in a Weather Service office. So, you know, there's plenty of other things that you could look into. And the important thing is to get creative help yourself stand apart from other people. Okay. So keep in mind all meteorologists are meteorologists. It does not mean much. It's not going to be good enough just to be that best forecaster and weather challenge or the best student with the highest GPA. Being a good forecaster, a fantastic meteorologist is going to be the minimum coming into the weather service. And so you can set yourself apart um, for those of you who have heard of PI, um, it stands for performance, image, and exposure. And so you want to remember this as you move forward in pursuing these. Now, what is PI? So it's a corporate model for career advancement. You can see this PI chart here uh, where performance is the first thing. It's about 10%. Um, and then you've got image and exposure. And so it's, it is a balance of all these things and how you're presenting yourself. Um, it's not what you know, and it's not who you know, it's who you know that knows what you know. And so that's one of the big take home things for Pi. Now performance is gonna be how you carry yourself um, or accomplish an action or um, how you're relating. Uh, and so that's your performance, it's only 10%. Of, of how you you can network with other people. It's the first slice of pie. It's gonna be your first taste. It's like when you taste something and you can tell immediately whether it's salty versus sweet. Um, your level of performance has to be up there. It has to be top, top notch because it's your performance, that first 10% that opens the door to the remaining 90%. Now your image is the next 30%, and this is the nonverbal communication. Um, your body language, your time, your gestures, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but then it also has a verbal communication component to it. How you present yourself, um, how your writing abilities, your speech, how you um, converse via email. And these days, it's how you're presenting yourself on social media and how you're relating to other people in that cyberspace. Um, and so that's very important. And they also get an idea of your tone. Are you a more casual, relaxed person? Are you a little bit more formal? Are you um, uh, constantly on the defensive? Are you an offensive? Type, aggressive type personality. And so those are all things that come from your image. Um, but then the big one is exposure. So the exposure is your visibility you have inside and outside of an organization. So um, this is the one that has the greatest impact on your ability to advance in your career. Um, so this is what informs others about your performance and your image. So those other 40% of what's making up you and um, this process and result being wired in the network. So again, we can't say it more, network, network, network. It is, um, again, it goes back to who you know that knows what you know. Um, and, and through networking, that can get your name out there and make you look more competitive. It's important that you not wait until your fourth year to make post-graduation plans. Trish and I, we're here to help. If your dream is to work for the Weather Service, um, if you don't want to speak with one of us, you can talk to your local National Weather Service office. They are always dealing with students. Um, there is usually at least one or two people there that are really passionate about that next generation of um, meteorologists, not only entering the Weather Service, but entering the field as a whole. Um, and so take the initiative, ask questions, 
um, again, you can contact Trisha or myself. We are happy to um, provide feedback on your resume um, or ways that you can really help network yourself. All right, thank you. Um, awesome, awesome talk. Um, can you guys tell that 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 these two women have great communication skills, um, just like they talked about? Um, this uh, is a is a great overview. I would I would like to say that you know they're right. It's very very competitive. Um, but I always say that the best way to combat that competitiveness is to educate yourself. Educate yourself on the process on exactly what you need to do. And, and that talk was a great start at doing that. So thank you guys uh, both. Um, we do have two questions. Um, so I'll open it up, this up to both of you. Uh, the first question of the day is from Erin. And she says, uh, in the past, I've had the same application for the same position referred and not referred. Why does something like this happen, and are there ways to combat this when applying? So that's a great question. Um, so right now, Erin, the way it's done, um, there's a series of questions that determines your eligibility, like um, questions like, have you left the weather service um, previously, or um, have you registered for the draft, things like that. Um, if you have answered one of those questions in a way that um, kind of kicks you out of the potential candidates, then there's not much that can be done. Um, and those are not questions where you can save the answers from application to application. So make sure that you go back and really review those. Now, if you have answered those questions identically for each of the, the applications, um, and you're still getting referred for one and not referred for the other. It usually is because of whoever uh, is in workforce management and processing that application. And it, if, if it is um, a disqualification or a non-referral based on the interpretation of that individual processing it, so maybe they misunderstood something that was in your application. Remember, they are not National Weather Service forecasters. And so something you may have in there may make 100% sense for one person, and then the next set of applications, it doesn't make sense for them. You always then have the option in that case of going back and saying, I would like to be reconsidered. And so what they will do is they will go back and re-review your application. This is also where good networking helps because if you have um, been able to connect with a meteorologist in charge and kind of make an argument for yourself that you're a qualified, very passionate, interested uh, person for, for a job that's opening at their office and they know to expect your name, if they don't see your name on that panel, then you can contact them and say, look, I think there's an issue. How do I go about getting um, re my application re-reviewed and so they can actually be an advocate for you and helping that happen as well. Trisha, I'm not it sure could, if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, it, I mean it could also be that say there's um, uh, for one office you're bidding at there's 500 applicants so you might not make the panel there but another office might only have 50 applicants and you might make the panel there. So it just depends on how many people are applying to which office and where you rank in those. It also depends on if there are veterans or others with like a disability, somebody who has a non-competitive um, uh, application, they're automatically put ahead of you. So if they apply for one office and not another office, that may make the difference too. So it may have nothing to do with you personally, but everybody else instead. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Tricia. That was that's what I was going to say as well. It, it probably has to do with um, the number of people applying. Um, we have time for just one more. Um, there are other um, questions here uh, that I will uh, work to give you a written response during the next talk. Um, and uh, if Tricia and Laura, you want to jump in on those as well, you can as uh, giving them written responses. Um, the next one is, uh, I'm a freshman majoring in meteorology. When should I begin to apply for an intern position or pathways? And that is from Amanda. For an intern position, um, you really can't apply until you're a senior. Um, they do allow you to apply maybe 
like four months before you graduate as long as you're going to meet those graduation requirements but they'd really rather you wait until you've after you've graduated for a pathways position it depends on how it's open like the example i showed was a gs7 well for a, to bid on something at a gs7 level you basically have to be in graduate school so if there's something that's open at a gs3 or a gs4 then an undergraduate would be would be eligible for those so you have to look at the gs level and it will say in the application who is eligible and how many years of college you have to have to be to be able to apply for it so look closely at the um at the announcement all right great uh, i have I have two things to add really fast. Sure. Um, in other government agencies, Pathways is um, utilized for people who are currently in school or recent graduates. Right now, the Weather Service is not using the recent graduate option, but you may be able to find a meteorology position that's outside of the Weather Service in a government agency that does use utilize that option if you have already graduated. And then the second is don't forget about the Holling Scholar. Holling Scholar is still a paid opportunity um, and you typically would want to apply for those after your um, sophomore year. Visitor. I'm not sure if you heard me that would be after your soft like for the summer following your sophomore year or your junior year of college. It says um, no examples of non NWS employees coming into management but now I've seen advertisement of all senior positions above forecaster as internal only that seems to create a barrier for meteorologists who might want to either leave the nws and gain experience in another sector which could then benefit the nws later or folks wanting to apply for a position in nws from outside the agency who might have a lot to contribute but are overqualified or don't want to start in an intern I've uh, seen this uh, with uh, many students and meteorologists that I talk with. Do you always have to enter the NWS as an intern? No, no, you certainly don't. Um, the uh, science and operations officer at our office, for example, he actually has his um, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, was then a high school math teacher for a while, um, then went to Ooh. OU to get his PhD in meteorology, worked for CAPS for several years, and then came in as a SU. Um, so it really just depends on how the position is advertised. For the offices that are going to be a little bit more competitive, you're probably only going to see internal uh, postings. But for an office that might be a little bit more remote where they might have problems, um, finding enough um, qualified applicants, it's possible that they might open up, especially Sioux positions, um, as uh, open to the public. I can't think off the top of my head, and maybe Ryan might have a, a maybe you might have a, a different opinion, or uh, I know Adam's on, he's in the weather service as well, but I can't think of any WCM positions that I've ever seen open to the general public. I've only seen those open internally. But Sue's, yes, because of the um, the, the science and, and, and technical background, I've seen several of those open to the public. Like I did mention before, you might have to look at a more remote office. So instead of a, being a GS-14 at a bigger office, you might come in as a GS-13. Um, but you would not necessarily have to start as an intern. That said, we're seeing more and more interns that have their PhDs coming in, um, or people who started working on a PhD, uh, then got an intern position. It's like, well, let me go ahead and finish this. So they end up getting their PhD through the process. I know that that's kind of rough to go from a PhD to an entry level intern position. Hopefully as they change the intern position, that'll improve at least the, 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 your own internal thoughts of what the intern position means. You know, I'm not just an intern. Um, but it's, it's really remarkable to see people who have their PhD, who have, who are humble enough to go ahead and bid on intern jobs it's usually pretty quick that they move on up. Um, so as long as, like I mentioned before, as long as you can check that ego at the door, it's really only a couple of years of putting up with the quote unquote intern position or only being a GS five or seven or nine or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, there, there are a few positions that are open um, to the public, especially at NCEP. There are more NCEP 
uh, center positions that are open to the public. Um, and uh, Dr. Fisher might have some thoughts on that too in, um, in her uh, presentation later on. So yeah, don't, don't count yourself out um, of the weather service just because you have a PhD and maybe you don't want to start over an entry level position. First of all, if the weather service is what you really want to do, you might have to consider it. But second, um, just you might just have to wait for the right position to open and be willing to go somewhere maybe a little bit less desirable. Yeah, those are good thoughts. Yeah, as an intern, I can say that it's, um, go ahead, it's totally fine. Yeah, so as an intern, kind of uh, what, what she was saying, um, like I think it's totally, you know, definitely livable where I am. Like I'm living in Southern California where it's, you know, very expensive. And so we're kind of, you know, working our way up year after year with um, the salary and all of that. So, um, you know, you work your way up pretty quick. It's not like you're at the, you know, one salary forever. So it's definitely doable. Yeah. One thing, um, Trisha, I was wondering, uh, wh when it says internal only, is that internal to the weather service or internal to the federal government? Federal government. So okay. people who are in, in the federal government would have, would anybody in the federal government would be able to apply. Now, while I did, there are other agencies that have meteorologists. There aren't that many. It's a bigger deal for like if you're bidding on a hydrologist position. So maybe you have some experience in the USGS and you've got your degree in civil engineering or hydrology or meteorology or whatever. So that we see we see a lot of that, that you might see some Corps of Engineers or USGS folks uh, go back and forth into the weather service on the hydro side of the house. There's not a whole lot of, um, um, I mean, like Brandon at, at FEMA, he actually was a meteorologist for the Weather Service, and then he jumped ship to go to FEMA, or whatever you want to call what he did. <laughs> so um, th there, there is some movement within the federal government, but because the Weather Service has most of the meteorology positions in the federal government, that's that it's going to be nine times out of ten a Weather Service hire. It's very rare to get an internal position where you get a somebody coming in from a different government agency as a meteorologist. Yeah, and I wanted to say too, um, on, on the subject of the PhD, um, you know, we've got a lot of students out there that have heard, you know, maybe bachelor's isn't enough. Um, a lot of a lot of the new hires have, have master's degrees. Now I'm hearing PhD stuff. Do I need a PhD? I don't think that's the case. Um, they are much more rare hire. It seems at the moment that master's degree is the sweet spot where you're going to make a lot of panels, um, but um, we don't see a ton of PhDs. They are becoming a little more frequent, but um, certainly uh, a PhD is not required for a, a weather service job. <clears throat> yeah, someone hired just six months ago. I can definitely attest to this. Um, I don't even have my full master's. I have I'm about halfway three quarters of the way through with it. So um, I think if you at least are, you know, starting your master's and all of that, you're in a pretty good shape. But PhD, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times it just is um, to get through that initial HR stage a lot of times. And, and so um, keep in mind, too, that if you're not really research oriented, that's not your game, that's not what you want to do. But you're like, oh, I, I need a master's to try to make myself more competitive. Um, there are several programs that offer non-thesis masters. Um, while it is, is good to go through that experience, you gain a lot of uh, computer programming skills, critical thinking skills. I do recommend it, um, but it is not required. So if you have a, a non-thesis masters, you basically do the coursework, uh, you get your masters, and then to the HR person uh, going through all of the, uh, the resumes, a, a masters is a masters. And so, um, you know, that's one thing to consider as well. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm working on. Master's in emergency management, non-thesis. So I'll kind of touch upon that in my talk as well. Excellent. I think, uh, Ryan, so and we didn't talk about this in our presentation. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying we didn't we didn't really talk about this in our presentation, but um, if you only have a bachelor's degree, the intern positions right now are open usually as five seven nines. Um, if you only have your bachelor's degree, you're not even eligible to bid on the nine. 
um, if you are in the if you're in like the top 10% of your graduating class, then maybe you're eligible to bid on a seven. But most bachelor students can only apply for the GS5 level. Once you have some master's experience, you can apply for the seven. Once you have your master's degree or some PhD work, you can apply for the nine. So that that just now. Even if you have your PhD, still apply at the five level because you never know. You might be on the top of the five and the bottom of the nine panel, depending on who else is applying. And so you might only, again, you might only get that GS5 offer, but still apply for all of the different levels that you're eligible for. Yeah, that's a good point. And and another and then another thing about that is if you're applying and um, you're making all of the panels uh, for each of the levels, then you're knocking a competitor off. So uh, it, it's a it's a way to kind of maybe winnow down the field a person or two. Mm -hmm.